Y'all sing with me, please.
who was and is and is to come. Amen. Only the Lord Jesus could sign his signature like that. Amen. And we have come today to Duval's Chapel to give him praise and glory. Uh, he is the only one worthy of the praise and glory that the earth uh, should be given him at all times. Every day, every day is a day that he hath made. Everything that we see in him, the Bible says, we live and move and have our being. And so why not give him praise and glory, not just on the first day of the week, but the second day and the third day and so on. He's a great God and we again have come to worship him. We bless God for all of you that have come out today. We thank God for all of you that will listen to us on YouTube and Facebook this week. Uh, those of you that are a part of our church but at this time are choosing to stay at home and we understand that, we respect that and may God bless you and, but we do miss you and we long to see your face again as, as Paul told one group of people, one church, I long to see your face again and uh, that's how we are here at the church but you stay healthy, you come when you feel comfortable with coming back to church and one of these days we're going to get back you know, they talk about the new normal, and, you know, I really don't know what is just normal here at Duval's Chapel. We just come and worship Jesus, you know. And every day is not the same because we believe that the Holy Spirit ought to just order it up, and then we obey Him. And, and I want to thank God for that. I thank God for being a part of a church, a really small part of a church, that loves the Lord enough to say, God, we're just going to let you be God. We're just going to let you be God. We're going to sing the songs that we believe that you've put on our heart. We're going to worship you in the spirit as you have taught us in your word to worship, worship you. And we have got a preacher who is just silly enough to preach the whole counsel of God. And so if that's normal, then we're normal. If it's not normal, then so be it. We're just going to let God be God. We're going to give him praise and glory at this time for the Bible. And uh, we do this every Sunday and and uh, someone told me, said, oh, how I missed the praise to the Bible. I just missed everything about being here, didn't you? <laughs> Amen. This is my Bible. The Word of God. Inspired. Infallible. Inerrant. Alive. Powerful. Preserved. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's Word will never pass away. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I will hide its word in my heart that I may not sin against God. Give him a great big hand clap of praise. <clears throat> I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 27. Psalm 27. We're not going to preach very long today, just till we get done. How's that? Just till we get done. Somebody said, oh me. Instead of amen, you said, oh me. No, we're just going to mind Jesus and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Psalm 27, 1 through 5. Most of you could quote this passage of scripture verbatim. It's a psalm of David, a psalm of David. Psalm 27, verse 1 begins... The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes... I'm not the only one in the building that has enemies and foes, right? I'll tell you this, guys, and, and this won't cost you any extra today. If you live, Christ, if you live righteous in Christ Jesus, the devil will make it his business to put enemies and uh, detractors and people that really just don't like you in your way. But guess what? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. 
Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should break, should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion, in the secret of His tabernacle shall He hide me, shall He set me up on a rock. Let's pray. Heavenly Father in the house of God at Duvall's Chapel, we come unto You, God, through prayer, Lord, because... There's nowhere else to go in this life. You only have the words of eternal life. We love you today, God, because you first loved us and gave your son a ransom and sacrifice for our sin. God, I pray for every soul that's gathered here today. Some may be here that's without hope. Some may be here that has been saved but no longer walk in the light as you're in the light. And others may have never come to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. May this be the day that they come and make their calling and election sure. I pray for all of those that are listening, Lord. Social media, through the internet, I pray, God, that you would bless them. And again, if there's one there lost, maybe even in their living room today, they would bow their heart and be saved. Help me to preach this message, not for fame nor fortune, but to bring you glory and honor and salvation to lost souls. I pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, praise the Lord. Lord. I want to preach a message that I've entitled, The Glorious Light in Life's Darkest Valleys. The Glorious Light in Life's Darkest Valleys. If there ever was a man in the scriptures that walked through dark valleys in life, It was this great psalmist, David, King David. We know him by different titles through life. He was a prince. He was a king. He was a prophet. He was a songwriter. He was everything that a man would hope to be, a godly man would hope to be in life. Even he, maybe the only person in the Bible that God said he is a man after my own heart. He was something special. And when I look at the book of Psalms, you know, I never had a diary. I never wrote a diary. Maybe some of you keep a diary. I believe that the majority of the 150 chapters of the book of Psalms is a diary of David. Record events, life events, good and bad in his life. He would talk about and and give praise to the God of creation, to the glorified glorified son that was to come into this world. And so I want to preach a message, the glorious light in life's life's darkest valley. I was listening to the song over and over again. I love that song. You know it. It's one of my favorites. You know, we, we will remember. We will remember. I think that's the name of it, isn't it? We will remember. Love that song. Kind of looked at me strange when I said that. I get song titles wrong. I just know how to sing them, folks. I just know how to sing them. But anyway, we were sitting there in the living room and I was listening to the song over and over and it kind of got under Carolyn's skin, to be honest with you, because I listened to it. I'm telling you, it was probably eight, nine times. And, and, but I did share with Carolyn. I said, in Psalm 23 and verse 4, where David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, fear, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Did you know the Hebrew writers, and, and, and of course I don't know Hebrew, but I'm taught that what could have been said or was said in the original Hebrew in that verse 4 was, through life's darkest valleys. When, yea, though I walk through life's darkest valleys. And the fellow that wrote that song, when he put life's darkest valleys, I feel like he knew a little Hebrew. I feel like he knew a little Hebrew. So David, here in Psalm 27, he began to magnify God. He began to magnify God in his life, as all of us should do from day to day. Through song, through just giving Him praise and worship, when we're alone by ourselves. You know, it's one thing to stand in the house of God, Spirit of the Lord flowing and giving praise and worship. But every once in a while, we ought to just start giving Him praise and worship when we're alone. Just Him and God. That's when I do my best singing, to be honest with you. When I'm by myself, just me and God. And so, he. this was David. David, I don't know where he was at this time, but he was reflecting back 
on life. He had to be. He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? Now I want you to know something. What David would do, he would encourage himself in the Lord. And I'm going to get to that more in a, in a moment when we get down to the other verses that I've read. But David would reflect back on life as uh, as a child of God, as a person of God, as a person that belonged to the, to, the, uh, to the church that was in the wilderness and the church that was to come under the grace dispensation. He would reflect back on life. And the reason he could do this is that from a child, from a child he was taught about God. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. His father Jesse and no doubt his mother and those that were around him, those in the temple would teach him about the living God. He had confidence in God. Confidence that many in the church or all of us who are a part of the body of Christ ought to have in our day. Confidence that was not just a passing fad. And I'm afraid that in many churches there are those that salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ is just something that bubbles up in them and that before long it's like a coke that fizzes out and it's not there anymore. Why? Because they've never been taught right according to the Word of God and maybe they was never saved even though they claimed salvation. But this was not the way it was with this David. David had been taught from a child that God was God, that He was the Creator of heaven and earth, that He sits upon the circle of the earth and He measures the heavens with the span of His hand. He is God. From a child He was taught that. I'm afraid that in this day, in this era of the church age, that we have dropped the ball with many of our children. Many of our children. Let me tell you something, Duvals. It's here that some children will ever hear the Word of God. It's the only place they will ever hear the Word of God. And I'm going to preach it if you throw your songbooks at me. We ought to get back to believing that it's the will of God that we train them up in the way they should go so when they're old, they won't depart from it. We ought to do these things. We ought to do these things. And somebody said, we'll just hand it over to the youth directors. And it, there's, there's really in, in churches, there are jokes that are being told about youth directors. They come and go, they come and go, they come and go. And I'll tell you this, they're not all bad, those that come and go. It's raising up children is a collective effort. It takes us all. It does in the home and it does in the church. And what the, what the home teaches, the church ought to teach. And what the church teaches, the home ought to teach. They ought to get the Word of God from the pulpit. They ought to get it in their Sunday school class. They ought to get it in their youth groups. They ought to get it when they go out to play. They ought to get it when they go to play basketball or soccer or whatever. Their God ought to be a part, a part of everything that they do in life so they can grow up like David. That, that salvation, that their confidence won't be a passing fad but it'll be a way of life because they've been taught that. And Duvals, we need to get back to being that. A church that honors, respects God in the way that, that we raise, rear up our children, train our children, and, and live an example before our children. I want to see us get back to that. I want to see a youth program that will blossom here, that will grow here, not because of the youth directors, but because of the church, because of the pastors, because of the moms and dads and grandmas and grandmas that make the effort and take the time and use their finances to do something which is right in the eyes of God, and that's to train up children in the way that they ought to go. Proverbs said, you train them up in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. When David got old, when he was an old man, he said this, I once was a young man, and now I'm old, and I haven't seen the righteous forsaken or his seed of baked bread. He had the same confidence in his old age that he had when he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Life's darkest valley. Life's darkest valley. He had faith in God. He had confidence in God. He loved the Lord. He had a devotion to God. Why? Because when he was a kid, somebody 
taught him about the Lord. Somebody taught him about the Lord. And then when he got old, when he got old, church wasn't a reproach to him. Church wasn't that something where mom and dad got hurt. Church wasn't that something where he got his feelings hurt. So church wasn't something that where somebody didn't do right and he used it as an excuse not to go back. Let me tell you something. Someone that has been trained in the ways of God, those dark valleys will be just a moment of time. And they'll be able to walk through that valley and come out on the other side praising the Lord for his goodness and mercy. David, when he was a kid, just a boy, just a boy, he was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. We want to get back to teaching that. We want our kids to grow up and be seen and not heard. You know what I was thinking, Hannah? Why haven't we got more kids in the choir? I believe Melissa would want that, wouldn't you, honey? You would. We say, well, they can't sing. Well, they'd spice the looks of the choir up, wouldn't they? Huh? I was thinking about some of those young ladies that sit in this church that ought to be in the choir. Well, Brother Gary, I don't sing very well. I don't either, but when I get in the Spirit, I satisfy God, and that's all we're here to do is satisfy the Lord, just to satisfy the Lord. Now listen to me. Listen to me. David, David loved God because somebody taught him to love God. It didn't just happen. It won't just happen. There'll be somebody and there was somebody in your life that inspired you, that taught you, that set the example for you and you in your spirit wanted to be like that person and then when you were saved, you was filled with the Spirit of God. Somebody said, how do you know David was filled with the Spirit of the Lord? Read 1 Samuel chapter 16 down about verse 13 when Samuel walked into the house of Jesse sent by God to anoint the next king of Israel and Abinadab walked in front of him and Shema walked in front of him he said these are rejected and he looked at David and he said David God does not see as man seeth man sees on the outward appearance God looks on the heart and he anointed him with oil he poured the horn of oil over David's head and David the Bible says was filled with the spirit of God from that time forth We need to get back to being filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Not just in our adult life, but in our childhood, in our young adult life. And as we become young men and women, we need to be teaching and preaching this, that it's the Spirit of the Lord that sanctifies us and sets us apart from other people. David was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. When he walked through life's darkest valleys, the light, this glorious light that he wrote about in Psalm 27 would be there to guide him and sustain him. When he ran down, and I believe Brother Trapman, he didn't just walk down into that valley. When he went to defeat Goliath, I believe according to the Word of God, he ran toward him. Why? Because he already knew what the outcome would be. That the Lord was his light and his salvation. Whom shall I fear? And he took those five smooth stones out of the brook. Knowing that those stones represented his rock. The Lord God Almighty. And with him, with him and through him. All blessings flow. All blessings flow. And so he defeated Goliath. Because he could think back. He had assurance that God would be with him. He knew that God would be with him. And he told Saul, he said, I was just a boy and I was keeping uh, Jesse's sheep. And there come a lion and a bear and I went out and got them by the beard and defeated them. I killed them. I slew them. And the same God that delivered me out of the paw of the bear and the mouth of the lion will deliver me from this unclean Philistine. And that he did. He's the light. He's the glorious light, not just the light, but the glorious light in life's darkest valleys. Paul said this light that shined out of darkness has shined in our heart to bring us to the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. He is that light. He's the light. The, the, great, the great John, John the Baptist said, I am not that light. 
But I come to bear witness of that light that all men through Him might believe He's the light. He's the light of the glorious gospel. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 says, For the light of the glorious gospel would shine unto them, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus and ourselves, your servants, for God's sake. He's the light of the glorious gospel. The gospel would be null and void if it wasn't for His light shining through it, upon it. Again, I want to tell you, David wasn't religious. He was godly. God's not looking for people to be religious. He's looking for people to sell out to Him, become godly, be sanctified through the spirit of holiness. But it, it was David's faith, hope, and charity. Through faith, hope, and charity, those around him taught, taught him this and instilled in him this, these virtues from a child. He was what he was because of God was who he said he was. He was God, the God of glory. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord's the strength of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? I want to tell you something. I want, let me ask you first of all, what is it that you fear most of all in life right now? All of us have fears. All of us have, that's where courage comes in. If you're full of courage, it doesn't mean that you don't fear. Every person that ever won the Medal of Honor in any war that's ever been fought was fearful of losing their life when they did what they did. But they, have, they were courageous and they did what they were supposed to do in the eyes of death, and they overcome their fear because they had a duty to do, and a job to do, a sworn duty to do. We as Christians, God doesn't say that we won't be fearful in our darkest valleys, but He says the love of God, perfect love, casteth out fear. Cast out fear. You can overcome your fears. But the things that you have learned from God and through God through your past experience. If you had a diary, if you had kept a diary of your Christian walk, what would it read? What would it read? Would it read that the Lord has been my light and my salvation and there's no fear because Jesus is with me and he'll sustain me. Verse 2 says, When the wicked and even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. This happened throughout his life. King of Israel, the king of the Jews, Saul, hounded him like a wounded fox, like a hound would hound a wounded fox. But David stood. Why? Because God was his fortress. God was his rock. God was his salvation. And he wrote in the Psalms all of these things. In, in Psalms uh, chapter 23 and verse 6, Remember what he said? Thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runneth over. He had physically, spiritually been anointed with oil by, by, by the prophet Samuel. But every day of his life, it was that horn of oil that was poured upon him that gave him hope and courage and, and delivered him from the fears of life. It's the oil in our life. It's the Holy Spirit that is represented by all throughout the New Testament in our life that sustains us and we overcome by the power of His testimony. And so, He says in verse 3, And though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should break out against me, in this will I be confident. We are not called with the spirit of fear. We're not called with the spirit of fear. Listen, listen. Satan's business is to bring fear in our lives so that we can't, we can't trust our faith, so that we won't trust our faith. This way, be sober, be vigilant. For our adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the lion roars to, dis, to instill fear in his prey. And then he preys on the young and the weak. Church, let me ask you to do this. There'll be times when your lip is quivering because you're going through this dark valley in life. It may be at a time of death. It may be at a time of temptation that you didn't do so well in. It may be at a time when those around you don't understand you. It may be at a time when your family is coming apart. 
But don't let the devil see your lip quiver at any length of time. Don't, don't let him see your lip quiver because we done read the back of the book and you're on the winning side. Your marriage may not stay together. I don't know. I see it often. Divorce is about, there's about as many divorce cases in the church as there is outside of the church these days. I remember as a young man, a young preacher, I remember Billy Graham giving the statistics that, that in the world, divorce was 50%. In the church, it was only like 10%. And he was glorifying God because Christians have, have, a, have, have, have something that the world does not have to trust in through the hard times and marital problems. And now it's sad to say that it's about 50-50. Divorce in the church, divorce outside the church. So I'm not going to stand up here and be this prosperity pre preacher that says if you live just right for God, everything going to be rosy. Yet I'll tell you this, the devil will make it his business that life will not be rosy for you. But God is still God. God is still God. Life may not turn out the way you hoped it would turn out. It may not be the way that you hoped it would turn out in the world. But in Christ Jesus, he will never leave you or forsake you. And if you fall short, if you sin and come short of the glory of God, you have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sin and not for our sin only, but for the sin of the whole world. What does that mean? He's the expiration of your sin. He's the one that can take care of it. Don't worry about old Joe over here, John Doe or Jane Doe that's criticizing you, that wants to eat up your flesh, that wants to see you fail. Trust in God who saved that he's greater than whatever's a matter in your life and you can overcome. Hallelujah. I ain't the only one that's had bricks thrown through their windows. I'm not the only one whose name shows up in graffiti with terrible words around them. Somebody said, Brother Gary, what in the world did you do to deserve that? I believe all I did was preach the truth. Huh? It's preach the truth. I'm telling you. Be careful when all men are saying good things about you. Be careful. They'll be the very ones sometimes that will want to stab you in the back. We're here. David had friends that turned on him. One of his darkest valleys was with his own family. With his own family. And I believe Brother Kevin may be the darkest valley. Was with his son Absalom who he loved more than life. His son Absalom, beautiful Absalom, whose hair weighed seven pounds every year when he got it cut. And some of y'all that couldn't get in the barber shop, you started looking like Absalom before you got your hair cut. Seven pounds. It wouldn't take but about that much to take care of old brother Gary. You know, Shannon, don't you laugh at that. Absalom was a spoilt royal brat. He felt like he had a reason to hate his father David. And I won't go into all of it. You Bible readers know exactly what I'm talking about. And the war was raging. 20,000 soldiers was dying in the valley. And David had given Joab, the commander-in-chief of his army, an edict, an order, do not kill Absalom. And Absalom forces was fighting his father's forces, David's forces and saw that he was losing. He jumped on his mule and started riding away from the battle and that beautiful hair was blowing in the wind and it, it caught on to a, a uh, dwarfed oak tree and there he was dangling on a tree and Joab rode up against the will of David and he shot three ar arrows through his black heart and killed him. What's the point? The point is Absalom had cursed his father and Absalom died a curse. Cursed is everyone that dieth upon a tree, the Jews believed. Now you listen to me. But through it all, David loved his son and it was a dark valley. But David didn't quit on God. David just rehearsed himself, encouraged himself in the Lord and he went a little further. This was his light and his salvation. And this is exactly what we ought to be in today's church, in today's life. Cancer may eat away at your flesh 
and destroy your bones and your bone marrow that gives you the life-flowing fluid in your veins. But it, it cannot destroy your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ. As a pastor, I have been encouraged more in hospitals and nursing homes and funeral homes than really I have in the church of the living God. And I get food and encouragement when I come to the house of God. I've saw mamas and daddies and I've witnessed it that they'd be so broken they couldn't stand up. But when they come through that dark valley, they were still on the witted side. Why? Because they encouraged in the Lord and they knew that there was a better resurrection bless God bless God don't you quit don't you give up don't let this virus don't let this virus uh, throw a, a wrench in the gear and begin to stop things in your life I'm glad that it didn't our church ain't we got a beautiful congregation this morning and I want to thank you that are visiting I want to thank you for coming out to a Bible-believing church and worshiping with us. And look at, look, at, look at verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord and I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Now listen, he said, though the enemy comes against me, though that forces are insurmountable, so they want to eat up my flesh as the birds of the air do once a carcass is laying out there in the sun. I, in spite of all of that, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to be trustworthy. I'm going to trust God because He's God. And now He says, one thing I want, one thing is the desire of my heart is I want to go to the house of God. Some of you, if you'd have read this about four or five weeks ago, you could have really got into it, couldn't you? I want to go to the church house. He was talking about the beautiful temple. The be or actually it was the tabernacle. Solomon would build the temple after David's gone. After David's gone. But they always had a place of worship. In the wilderness it was the tabernacle. And now as they're in Israel, it's still the tabernacle. But they worship God. And they go to the tabernacle. And there it was. It was designated. And it was, it was sanctified. It was cleansed by God to be a holy place unto the Lord. This is where we're at today. It's not just a building. It's God's building. It's not just a place. It's a place where we have dedicated, that we have dedicated to worship and serve the living God, David's God, Abraham's God, and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. It ought to be our heart's desire to be a part of this place every time the doors are open. It ought to be our heart's desire. David said, my desire is I want to be in the house of God. I want to, uh, all the days of my life, I want to go there. Now this was impossible because David was not of the tribe of Levite. He couldn't be there every day. Only the priest could. But David wanted to be. His desire was this, to inquire in the house, of, to, to see the beauty of God in the tabernacle there. That, isn't this beautiful? I'm telling you, I'd come here and preach. Lucretia, she's beautiful. She is. But I wouldn't see her. I would be looking at basically empty pews as I come to preach. And it was good as long as it had to last. But I'm so glad that the beauty of the Lord is revealed in the congregation of the righteous. The beauty of the Lord is revealed in the congregation of the righteous. Men and women and boys and girls filled with the Spirit of God and worshiping God and loving one another as they love themselves. This is God's way. This is the assembly of God, and we ought to have this desire. It shouldn't be a pain to go to the house of God. It wasn't for David. It wasn't just out of commitment or dedication that he went to the house of God. He had a desire in his bones, in his heart, in his soul to be with God's people, worshiping and serving God. And you know what? I can tell you why it was like this with David. Because from a child, he was taken to church. He was taken to the house of God. And he grew up and it was just part of his life and who he was. This is what we need to do and be here at Duval's Chapel to instill in our young people <clears throat> that this is not something that is foreign or out of the ordinary. 
But this is a part of our lives. This is going to be a part of your life, all the days of your life, to worship and serve God in the house of God. It doesn't have to be here, but it needs to be somewhere. It needs to be somewhere. Sure, and I'm going to go back to it. There were times in David's life when things went terribly wrong in those dark valleys. You know the story of David. You know how he sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And it was a terrible thing. And a lot of people would have just wrote him off or make, made him a second class Christian or a second class Hebrew, a second class Jew, but not God. Not God. David repented fully. David turned to God and cried out unto Him, O Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Because I'll tell you this, when salvation begins to dissipate in your life, it'll be the joy of salvation that is the first to go. You'll be miserable and you'll make everybody around you miserable. There's no one more aggravating than a backslidden Christian. I'm telling you, it's the truth, isn't it? Don't y'all look at me like this. Every one of you has backslid somewhere to a point. I'm not saying you was backslid to the point that you was out of fellowship with God. But I'll tell you the first thing. When Satan comes after me and aggravates me and aggravates me and aggravates me, the first person that picks up on it is Carolyn because I start aggravating her. That's how it works, isn't it? Huh? She's got to live with me. She don't have any other choice. Now y'all can just vote me out, but she's got to live with me. She ain't voting me out. I came in one day and she was packing her bags. I said, honey, where are you going? She said, I'm leaving you. I started packing my bags. And I said, I'm going with you. <laughs> you ain't getting rid of me that easy. Huh? And Duval, you ain't getting rid of me that easy either. Huh? I believe that when it's time for old brother Gary to go, the Holy Spirit will order it up and we'll all just know it and I'll, I'll be gone, you know? Probably in a moment, a twinkling of an eye, you know? Y'all may be standing at my bedside. Y'all may pass the coffin. I want to tell you something. Don't you cry for me. Hallelujah. Don't you cry for me. I know, I know whom I have believed that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I'm not trusting the deacon board, and I do trust the deacon board, but not with my salvation. I'm not trusting my wife, Carolyn. I'm not trusting my family. I'm trusting God. And I know that I have believed him, and he will keep my soul against that day of the darkest valley. He'll do it. He has done it. He'll continue to do it. He'll continue to do it. Let me go on real quickly. Man, I'm glad I'm in the house of the Lord. We would have had a big amen. I'm going to give you another shot at it. I'm glad I'm in the house of the Lord. Amen. There you go. I'm hurrying. Look at verse 5. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. And he shall set me upon a rock. Our Jesus, he's not the greatest of the greatest. He's the one and only. I want to read you something that I wrote down earlier. I think about him. I think about all the titles that he holds and what he has been through the ages and since time as we know it began. The first place he shows up in Scripture is three chapters in to the Bible. Now, I know he's the creator. I know he's the one that spoke and all things became what they are. But as far as being mentioned by God, by the Word of God, it was in Genesis 3 and 15 where it says He's the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman will bruise your head. He's talking to Lucifer. In Joshua, he was the, He's the captain of the Lord's host. In the Old Testament, the Jews called Him El Shaddai, Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sabbath. Isaiah said 700 years before he was born, his name, shall be called, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I done told you, he sets upon the circle of the earth and he measures the heavens by the span of his hand. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is Lord. He wasn't voted in and he won't be voted out and he sure ain't going to quit. Has he ever quit on any of you? Has he ever quit? He sure ain't going to quit. 
I, he, he said, before Abraham was, I am. I'm the door to the sheepfold. I'm the living water. I'm the true vine. I'm the bread of life. I'm the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. I am he that lit was, was alive and now I was dead. Then I was dead and now I'm alive forevermore. I'm the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the fairest of 10,000. He is not the old man upstairs. He is not a figment of somebody's imagination. He is the Lord God Almighty and of His kingdom there shall be no end. He's the light. He's this glorious light. This glorious light that shines in the darkest valleys. Now some of you that are young today, you may not really be able to wrap your mind around a dark valley, the darkest valleys. A lot of valleys in life. But then there's those that, God, I, I don't know. I don't know. If you, if you don't go with me, I can't make it. I can't make it. I remember working in the coal mines. I'd just come to Butler County to pastor. I'd pastored eight years before that in two other churches. And I was working Ohio County in the coal mines and I was running a coal loader and I'd load coal trucks and you coal miners know what I was doing. And I'd get there an hour before everybody else and fix roads and clean coal and have everything ready for the trucks. And God was calling me and speaking to my heart to go full time in the ministry. And be- I'd always take lesser jobs in life so that I could pastor. And me and Carolyn would struggle a lot financially and this, that, and the other. And boy, I was making more money than I'd ever made. And that year, I was going to make more money than I'd ever made in life. But you see, when I accepted God's call to preach, it couldn't be about money anymore. It had to be about Him. And Carolyn understood this. Now, I wasn't a preacher when I married Carolyn, so... You know, she was just kind of grandfathered into this thing, you know. So, I remember it was on my heart and little did I know it was on Belmont's heart. And, and how are we going to make it? The offerings on, at Belmont was $200 a week. My monthlies was more than that, you know. How are we going to do this? I remember I was driving an old 73 GMC pickup truck and I pulled over on the side of the road down there in Princeton, Kentucky. It was like 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. I got out of that old truck. Now this was a dark valley. You say, well, how could that be a dark valley God's calling you to do? I'm going to tell you something. The flesh don't want you to do anything for God. And it wasn't just on me. It was on Carolyn. It was on the kids. It was on this church. And, And I remember I got down on my knees in that blacktop road. And I called out to God. And there's been a few times in my life when there was a peace that passeth all understanding that would come me. I didn't hear audible voices, Kevin. I just knew it was of God. I came home and I told the family. I gathered the kids. They were young together. And I said, kids, this is what we're going to do. If it's the will of God, Belmont will sign off on it. They just about shouted because they, they had already been talking about it and I didn't know it. That was... 36, 7 years ago. There's been some dark valleys since then. But what I'm saying is a dark valley is not always from the devil. A dark valley, because of our flesh, can be of God. God calling you. God speaking to your heart. God wanting you to step out on faith in ministry. In ministry. It can be a tough time in life wrestling with that. Just like when he called me to preach, I thought I, when he, actually when he convicted me of my sin and was bringing me to South, I thought I was losing my mind. And all it was was my sins that were black was before me. And I was being condemned and convicted because of them. And I came to Jesus and he washed them white as snow. What's your dark valley today? What will it be tomorrow or the next day? There will be one. There will be one, but I promise you, you'll you'll make it through it. You'll go through it. Yea, though I walk through the life's darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. David said in King James, the valley of the shadow of death. Let me tell you this. The shadow of a gun cannot shoot you. 
The shadow of fire can't burn you. The shadow of a dog can't bite you. And when you go through this dark valley with Jesus, that's all it can be. Death can be, will be just a shadow and all other things in this world that tries to bring you down will be just a shadow because God is the substance. He's our life. He's our salvation. Whom shall we fear? I'm going to give an invitation. I feel like somebody maybe is carrying a burden on your heart that you don't need to carry any longer. Bring it to the Lord. Casting all your care upon Him because He cares for you. Yeah, come on singers. Come on. Come on. And we're going to have church. I don't know about you, but I'm not much on this social distancing anyway. Let's just have church. Let's have church. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Please. Please, please. Obey the Spirit of the Lord. Obey the Spirit of the Lord. Brother Gary, hugging somebody's neck. I don't believe God would order that up if He's going to give you the coronavirus. And if He does, He'll bring you through the darkest valley. Won't He, Jim? Won't He, Jim? Amen. Amen. Let's have church. Someone need prayer? Just come on. Come to Jesus. Come on. Before